Hey, good morning. This is, uh, good afternoon. Sorry, it's 12 o'clock. This is Edward Ng uh, with the Pittsburgh Foundation. Thank you everyone for attending. I uh, just wanted to let everyone know that uh, this uh, this is being recorded and uh, maybe rebroadcast. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over. Um, let's get started. Good afternoon, Pittsburgh Foundation donor family. Thank you so much for joining us in webinar mode under these unprecedented circumstances. When I was planning this video gathering with our development and donor services team, I remembered back to when I hosted our fall donor event just about a year ago. It was my first official act after taking over as president last June, a boat tour of the exciting developmental and environmental improvements along our riverfronts. It was a beautiful evening and the turnout was wonderful. The boat was full and there was music and great food and drink. There was a guided tour featuring a lot of projects completed when I headed River Life, the organization responsible for waterfront development. And there were new initiatives I was amazed to hear about and a new president of River Life. It was such a wonderful setting to be able to talk to many of you about how the foundation could do more and be more effective in the community. Did I say all that happened a year ago? Or is that 100 years ago in COVID-19 time? The disastrous coronavirus has taken an unprecedented health and economic toll around the world, across our country, and in every community of the Pittsburgh region. And it has kept us physically apart. So we are forced to find new ways to be together, such as this webinar today. As a recent veteran of teleconferences, which faces freeze in mid-sentence, echoes compete with feedback, and people drift in, out of the little screen frames, believe me, I know that we're dealing with an imperfect substitute for the real thing. Hopefully, we won't have too many of these glitches during this hour. Despite them, though, the technology that enables virtual gatherings has been a godsend during this public health lockdown. We at the Pittsburgh Foundation certainly feel grateful to be able to use it to continue the 20 year tradition of special donor events in which we celebrate and thank you for what you do as an integral part of the foundation. At most of these donor events, we try to explore an area of community life or dig into an important quality of life issue. And we're doing that in this virtual session with an update on the progress of the Emergency Action Fund. For a quick review, on March 16th, we teamed with our regional philanthropic peers, the Heinz Endowments, Richard King Mellon Foundation, the Henry L. Hillman Foundation, as well as the United Way of, of Southwestern Pennsylvania to provide a fast process to get emergency relief to nonprofits who are meeting the essential needs of our residents, those who are most vulnerable in this crisis. Most of you in our donor community should be very familiar with this as the first thing our foundation does in times of adversity. And our donors are always essential to whatever success we have. To explain it by the numbers, we're proud to announce that of the 8.3 million we raised through the fund, Pittsburgh Foundation donors and our foundation's discretionary funds counted for nearly 1.8 million. So the first message I need to give you this morning before we get into the details of the fund and what it is accomplishing is thank you, thank you for unprecedented generosity to meet an unprecedented emergency. Our, our donors showing, your showing, is such a wonderful thing to be able to report to the community. It demonstrates the power of a community foundation to go quickly to where the needs are greatest. Time and again, you demonstrate how Pittsburghers come together in the face of adversity to support each other. That ethos has been the driving force behind our foundation's neighbor helping neighbor philanthropy for 75 years now. And in the spread of this virus, has just, it's just revealed how wide the gaps are between those who are taken care of in our regional economy and those who struggle to get access. In comparison to the types of adversity the foundation has dealt with before, we are now in uncharted territory. Unemployment is at record highs and demands for services are soaring. 
People who have never needed services before suddenly find themselves, for example, in a mile long line of cars at the regional food bank. They are deciding between making the car payment or the housing payment. As we've seen, the effects of this pandemic continue to ripple across all facets of life. As medical researchers race to find treatments, a cure, and a vaccination, we will continue to adapt and overcome challenges together. You'll see evidence of that in the use of the Action Fund. In our public announcement on Tuesday, we reported that 228 grants have been issued from the fund, with more to be issued after the application process is closed on Friday. There are 3.3 million in systems response support, such as making it possible for the Allegheny County Health Department to be able to house vulnerable groups who, have, who were unable to self-quarantine. In addition to the system support funding, 216 grants ranging from 5,000 to 25,000 and totaling 3.9 million have been made to nonprofits with budgets under 5 million. These grants benefit organizations in Allegheny, Beaver, and Westmoreland counties serving predominantly low income households. Grants provide direct assistance to individuals impacted by COVID-19, to community health facilities, and to small or arts organizations facing revenue losses from mandatory cancellations. These numbers prove that the broad assistance we've been able to provide is possible because of the contributions from our donors, corporations, and other foundations. The period in which we are living right now is riddled with uncertainty. But the one certainty that I have is knowing the extraordinary generosity in this community provides a psychological uplift that tells us we will get through this period and be stronger on the other side. Southwestern Pennsylvania has always shown tremendous resiliency. We've proved that renaissances aren't just an historical phenomenon. But as the days and weeks ahead present new challenges, I know that Pittsburghers and specifically you, our donors, will meet them head on. I can assure you that our staff team has worked as hard as is humanly possible to direct resources to the people and the places who need them most with tireless dedication, even as they adjust to working from a distance. For details on our fundraising to date and how we're meeting the goals of the Emergency Action Fund, I wanna turn this over to Lindsay Aresti, our Director of Donor Services. Later, you will hear from Michelle McMurray, Director of Grant Making for Children, Youth and Families, and Chris Ellis, our Social Change and Philanthropy Fellow. They will discuss how our grant making is addressing community needs and vulnerabilities that have been made glaringly apparent by the coronavirus coronavirus. Then Christy Stuber, our donor services officer, will offer ways in which you can continue to support our nonprofit community. Again, thank you for joining us virtually. And I promise that we will be back together in person for future donor events, maybe another boat ride. But until then, stay healthy and take care of one another. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, hello, everybody that's joining us today. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Lindsay Resty, the Director of Donor Services at the Pittsburgh Foundation. It is May, and at the end of the month, we were supposed to be convening for our, our usual spring donor event. Um, so I'm sad that I can't see a lot of your faces in person. Just a quick note on that. You can see us, but we can't see you. So I had to put on earrings and a scarf and look fancy, but you didn't have to. You don't have to. We can't see you. Uh, we also can't hear you. So you're just looking um, at the faces at the top of the screen. Um, a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, the first is, as Edward mentioned, for those of you that were at the beginning of the call, this is being recorded. So if you've missed it, um, if somebody has missed it that you know or you want to refer back to it later, we will be sending out the recording link um, after the fact. Another piece is um, regarding questions. So on the right hand part of your screen, you will see something called our control panel. Uh, there is an opportunity there um, for you to submit questions in the question pane. 
We will not be answering questions until the end of the presentation. So any time from now until the end of the presentation when Christy Stuber is gonna facilitate a Q&A, you can enter in a question about anything that we've said and we'll address it at the end. Um, also, if you um, are having, your likely your default has been that you have joined through the computer audio. Um, I know that some of us, at least here internally at the Pittsburgh Foundation, have had issues with the internal audio. You are able to join by telephone. You just click the telephone button and they'll give you dial-in instructions. So then you can dial in using your telephone if you're having audio issues. So with that, I'm gonna start the presentation today, um, an update on our fundraising and the creation of the Emergency Action Fund. I may refer to it as EAF throughout this, its creation and structure. So the Emergency Action Fund is, is comprised of two components, what we call the Community Fund and what we call the Advised Fund internally. And those both flow into the overarching Emergency Action Fund. So the community fund is a compilation of large contributions from the four largest private foundations in the region. So the Pittsburgh Foundation, the Richard King Mellon Foundation, the Heinz Endowments and the Hillman Family Foundations all came together with $4 million to start the Emergency Action Fund. And with that, we've been able to make some immediate larger grants to some organizations in need. So those, primarily those grants, as Lisa mentioned in her remarks, one of the grants went to the PA Department of Human Services to provide quarantine space for those that could not self-quarantine. There was a large grant to the United Way of Southwestern Pennsylvania for the 211 hotline and their emergency needs funds. And there was a grant to the PA Department of Health to provide cleaning, staffing, immediate response to their issues at the beginning of the pandemic. So the community fund is comprised of 4 million. And then the advise fund, which is the second half of the emergency action fund is where our donors have generously contributed as well as uh, we've seen quite an uptick in gifts from the public as well as corporations, private foundations and individuals. So the advise fund is um, primarily where we are supporting organizations, which Michelle and Chris will talk about in depth, um, that have asked for operating support, um, that have asked for emergency assistance um, because of COVID-19. Uh, it also has supported federally qualified health centers, and lastly, small arts, arts organizations that have had to cancel their programming as a result of this. Um, and have immediate needs to satisfy that um, closure. So the uh, community fund on the next slide. So, so the application process for the advise fund has been a simplified process. So we took an application that standardly for the Pittsburgh Foundation was much more lengthy. We simplified that down with the idea that we could get funding out faster. So uh, what once took uh, several months to uh, go from a nonprofit submitting an application to us sending a check has now been condensed into a 15 day period. Um, and we're, we're quite proud of that. That opened on April the 1st. Um, what has been amazing is that when we first started talking about the Emergency Action Fund, we thought that we would only have enough resources to fund two rounds. We just have recently completed our fourth round of grant making because we have more resources available. Nonprofit organizations are applying to us and they can submit an application for from $5,000 up to $25,000 that fits in one of those funding priorities that I discussed on the last slide. So um, another part of our outreach in the community through the Emergency Action Fund, we were pleasantly surprised uh, shortly after we launched it at some of the recognizable faces in the community stepping forward to assist us. Um, down below, you'll see Cam Hayward from the Pittsburgh Steelers contacted us very early on and offered his support. Uh, we quickly shipped him that Spread Hope t-shirt that you see in the slide there. That is the Pittsburgh Foundation's campaign for the EAF called Spread Hope. 
um, and he uh, filmed two uh, advertisements for us. I imagine that many of you, your your um, TV time has clicked up a bit, and perhaps you've seen his face um, advocating for the Emergency Action Fund and asking you to contribute. Um, because I hear from from friends that that the advertisement is um, up and running, as well as the Edgar Snyder Law Firm has. Um, partnered with us and donated to the Pittsburgh, um, to the Emergency Action Fund as well. And that um, broadcast has been happening. And lastly, um, I know at least in this household, uh, the coffee intake has increased significantly. And with that, um, every morning when I have my cup of coffee, I have a cup of Emergency Action Blend. And Emergency Action Blend is Crazy Mocha, who uh, contacted us about the Emergency Action Fund. They developed a coffee blend, and uh, proceeds from the coffee, some of the proceeds from the coffee blend go to the Emergency Action Fund of the Pittsburgh Foundation. So if you'd like to purchase additional cups of Joe, you can do that and support the EAF at the same time. So in summary, um, we have seen a broad range of gifts from a lot of different uh, sources, and um, we're quite quite proud of that. Seven hundred and fifty thousand of the money that we've raised from the Advise Fund has come from our donor Advise Fund community. So that's you guys listening in on the call. We're thankful for that. Um, and the combined Emergency Action Fund, as of today, has raised eight point three million dollars. But with that. Um, the need, the needs are far outpacing the resources. The need is the needs are overwhelming, and so um, I am going to turn on, over the presentation to my colleague Michelle McMurray, who will talk more about the needs within the community. Hello, everyone. It's nice to be with you today uh, just to talk a little bit about what the activity has been of the Emergency Action Fund with my colleague Chris Ellis. Um, I'm just going to start by talking a little bit about the kind of data um, around the community fund. So um, as of April 28th, that's when we uh, finished reviewing the first kind of three rounds of, of funding. Um, we had received 437 applications uh, for the fund. So that's a huge response. The fund only opened, um, you know, about three and a half weeks ago. And so um, a lot of applications uh, received in a very short period of time, which demonstrates the level of need um, that there that there's been in the community. Um, we have reviewed a total of 363 of those. Um, the requests totaled almost $10 million. So in terms of what organizations felt that they needed in order to really navigate this difficult period of time, um, $10 million. But as you know, um, and as Lindsay noted, the grants range between $5,000 and $25,000. Um, and so uh, we approved 216 of those grants, totaling um, 3.7 million. Um, there were these four categories that people could request under that emergency financial assistance, operating support for uh, arts organizations, um, as well as uh, health centers. But the largest majority of those who requested support, they were for operating support. And I'll talk a little bit about what that looked like. 77% um, of the uh, organizations were from Allegheny County. Not really a surprise uh, given how many of the nonprofits uh, in the region are located in this area, um, but the other 23% um, did go to organizations in Allegheny, I mean, in Beaver and uh, Westmoreland County. Uh, we were focused on smaller organizations. Uh, we know that two thirds of the nonprofit sector have uh, budgets under uh, $500,000, and so we know that most nonprofits are small. Um, and so we really wanted to target those, um, especially those who might have the greatest need, have the least ability to really pivot or transition um, during this time. So we met that goal. Uh, the average budget size of organizations was about $1.8 million. And um, over you know, a third of them had budgets under $500,000. So again, we really wanted to target our support where it might be most needed. Um, and then we know that uh, organizations led by people of color often have a little more difficult time accessing philanthropic support. And so we were very glad to see that um, almost 20% of our grants uh, were distributed to organizations that were um, led by people of color. Um, what we funded, 
So these are the major categories uh, of funding uh, for this particular program. Um, they fell into these categories. All of the grants were administered as operating support, so organizations would have the flexibility to use them as they felt needed. But I will say that many of the organizations who applied for funds were asking for specific support to either sustain their operations, to expand programming to meet increased needs or demand, or shift their programming to respond to a need in the community that really was not met uh, by another program. For instance, we had in the child care category, Arsenal Family and Children's Center, like most child care centers in Allegheny County, they were mandated to close in mid-March, which means they are not receiving any tuition or fees, but continue to pay their staff and, of course, had their overhead costs, like their rent and utilities that they still had to meet. Um, there's also the Western PA Diaper Bank, um, which some of you, I'm sure, know. They had already distributed a half a million diapers so far this year when the pandemic started, but they had seen an increase um, in demand since uh, March. Uh, the, st the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. And their request to the Emergency Action Fund was to assist them in increasing their distribution of diapers and wipes. And they projected that it was going to reach 50,000 diapers per month um, as, of, as, of, as of May. Um, so their grant was really specific to helping to meet that increased demand. And then there are after-school providers like Youth Places, which is located on the north side, which needed funding to shift its service delivery from homework help and other out-of-school time activities to distributing food, ensuring that children who normally receive breakfast from and lunch at school were still able to receive those critical meals while their schools are closed. Um, and then lastly, in the arts category, there are small arts, arts organizations like Society for Contemporary Craft, which we believe are critical to a thriving, healthy community. And they were scheduled to actually open their new facility in April after being displaced um, after 33 years from their home in the strip district. The organization had planned a, a gala uh, fundraiser, which they had to cancel, and all of their classes were canceled during that time period, and they weren't able to earn any revenue from art sales. And so you can imagine what kind of an impact that has on the organization that's not only trying to do what it normally does, but also is navigating the transition into a new space. So these are just examples of some of the organizations that we funded um, across these categories, um, which we think are really, really critical. Of course, as you saw, there were a lot of applications in, um, and not all of them were funded. And so I just want to talk about a few categories of, of, uh, of funding um, that we weren't able to make this round, but we still know and understand to be critically important. So one category was around projected needs resulting from COVID-19. So this emergency action fund was really about meeting the most immediate critical needs, the impacts that were really being felt right now most immediately by um, neighborhoods and, and communities and families. There were some organizations that submitted requests um, thinking forward into the future, a few months down the road, understanding that there may be things that they expect that their community or families may need, but they hadn't yet started to experience the demand for that yet. And so those requests weren't uh, funded through the, the program, although we understand that those needs will likely come and will be important. There are also workforce development organizations um, that had requested support. These are organizations that help people find um, and, and secure new employment. Um, but it, resume help and other things that, as you know, most of our businesses um, have been closed and their services, they really haven't been able to transition uh, because there's not really opportunities for them to connect folks to new employment. And they're still pivoting and transitioning their support. So we recognize the importance of this, uh, recognize that this will be a need um, as particularly as businesses start to open and, and folks are looking for new jobs, um, but not necessarily in the most immediate category right now. Also, organizations that were looking at systems and policy change, um, one area that you may be familiar with is that there's currently a moratorium on eviction and utility shutoff. Um, and while that's helpful to families who can, uh, who will be able to still maintain stable housing, even if they're unable to pay their rent or their utilities right now. Um, we know that those moratoriums will end, and some organizations were really focused on how do we change policy? How do we begin to think forward down the line to when these moratoriums end and how can we really impact systems change for families? Um, and then the other was small business supports. We understand the importance of, of that as well, um, but that was another area where we were not um, providing funding. Um, 
what I'd like to transition to is my uh, colleague, Chris Ellis, who's going to tell you a little bit about why. So the foundation uh, really takes seriously our role in being on the ground and listening to folks in community. Um, and so the criteria for the Emergency Action Fund, those categories of support that I talked about earlier, were really developed by listening to and talking with our community partners, our nonprofit partners. And Chris is going to talk to you now about what we heard and how that shaped our response. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you to all the donors for joining us today and for your generous support. Um, I'm appreciative of the opportunity to share a little information about the Emergency Action Fund and our outreach to nonprofit partners. Uh, so Michelle uh, shared information about some of the data and statistics as it relates to the fund, and I'm going to get into the details of our conversations with our partners that are providing services on the ground. So when the impact of COVID-19 was uh, starting to be felt in our region in mid-March, uh, the foundation staff, um, in adhering to um, one of our values of voice, engaging individuals who are impacted, uh, decided that we needed to reach out to organizations to better understand how their staffing and operations were being impacted by this public health crisis, but also how the lives of the individuals they served were being impacted as well. Um, so, between about a 10-day period, between March 16th and the 27th, uh, we conducted more than 50 interviews with nonprofit leaders to understand some of these initial impacts. Uh, we are so grateful for the time that these organizations shared with us, knowing that uh, they were just starting to deal with this crisis, um, and we are just really grateful that they were willing to share their, their knowledge with us. Um, a week later, we hosted a call with some grantees in our Small and Mighty Grants Program uh, to understand how this was impacting smaller organizations um, and the individuals that they served. Um, in mid-April, we had a follow-up webinar with individuals who participated in the initial interviews uh, to see how things were changing, how things have changed. And we know this is a rapidly changing situation, uh, so we want to do our best to stay relevant and timely um, in terms of, of that impact. Um, and lastly, um, as Michelle mentioned, one of the priority areas of the funds um, is to support arts organizations and individual artists. Uh, so our wonderful arts team uh, conducted outreach of their own to talk uh, to individuals who are contributing to the arts and culture space here in our region. Um, and they spoke with uh, more than 50 partners in that space uh, for the same purpose, just to understand um, not only how they're being impacted, but what supports and strategies may be helpful um, in addressing some of those needs. Um, from these conversations, uh, there are some common themes uh, that developed, and I want to uh, share just a few of those with you all today. Uh, so obviously when we had those initial conversations, there was a lot of concern um, about staffing shortages as these organizations budgets were being impacted, um, losing fee-for-service revenue um, and the potential loss of donations. Uh, they also shared concerns about childcare needs, uh, not just for the individuals they served, uh, but also for their staff. Um, in these early conversations, uh, there was a lot of talk about um, what would happen to organizations if this situation prolonged. We are now um, almost two months from the initial interviews, um, and we continue to engage with, with organizations and uh, not knowing uh, how long this uh, will be with us and be continuing to impact us. Um, they shared a lot of information and concern about what the full impact uh, of COVID-19 will be on their operations um, and how they will need to pivot and adapt uh, to serve, uh, continue to serve the individuals uh, in need of their services. Um, some additional themes, um, at least early on, were the lack of clarity about available nonprofit supports. Um, to Lisa's earlier point in her intro, uh, we've been just so impressed with how the philanthropic community here in, in Pittsburgh and our, our region have come together to be responsive to the needs of, of nonprofits, uh, but also the business and government sectors as well. Uh, there's been a real response to ensure that that sector is given uh, the resources they need to continue providing uh, support in this challenging time. Um, we learned from a lot of organizations, unsurprisingly, that staff are overwhelmed by this crisis and require support. 
Um, and I know it's on the screen, but I just wanted to, to read this quote because it really uh, continues to resonate with me. Um, an executive director we interviewed said, I lie awake at night wondering how and if we'll get through this and who won't. I'm working 15 hour days and I don't know if we're doing the right thing if we're, or if we're doing the only thing. And this was a theme uh, throughout the conversations, just not knowing what support is needed, how long is this going to last, but just showing up and continuing to be committed uh, to the individuals they serve. And I think that is also reflected in uh, the next little slide there you see, despite stress, staff and volunteers have stepped up in incredible ways. Um, I said earlier that we've just been so impressed through our conversations with nonprofits um, and appreciative of their resilience and their continued commitment uh, to ensuring that even through this challenging, uncertain time, uh, that resources remain available uh, to serve individuals. Um, in addition to the common themes from the conversations that we had with our nonprofit partners, uh, we also heard uh, information that was relative to specific sectors. Uh, so Michelle laid out in a previous slide what those sectors were. Um, I just wanted to um, highlight a couple things that we've heard uh, from those conversations. Uh, so with child care providers, uh, we know that families rely on them for a safe place to, to bring their children, uh, but they're more than that. Uh, they provide valuable resources connecting uh, children and families to food, providing diapers and, and other important resources. Uh, so as these providers have been closed, uh, families are, are losing um, and are missing out on that vital support system. We've heard through conversations, however, that even though their in-person operations are closed, these providers continue to be creative um, using virtual supports um, and continue to stay connected uh, to best serve uh, those relying on their services. Um, and when we talked to our food providers, uh, we heard that organizations are struggling to get food to individuals who need it. Um, we know that's um, in large part due to volunteer shortages, uh, but also agencies that deliver food um, have some have had to close. Uh, so again, these organizations are, are thinking innovatively and creatively um, and ensuring that food is available uh, to those who need it and even to meet the increasing demand for the service now. As we talk to our senior providers, we learn that seniors and family morale is a major concern. And these providers have uh, provide virtual supports to uh, allow seniors to continue to connect with their families now that they're unable to see them in person, uh, but also have thought about opportunities to ensure that they're supported and that morale is high as they navigate this, this challenging time. As we look at some of the other sectors on the next slide, um, healthcare, uh, initially when we had these conversations, um, a resounding message shared was just the limited supply of personal protective equipment. Um, and as they sought to serve both the mental and physical health care needs of individuals and not having enough access to this valuable resource in order to do that. As we talked about housing, Michelle mentioned this a bit, but um, with staffing and volunteer shortages, some organizations have only been able to serve existing clients. And we know that affordable housing and homeless services are going to be uh, really important in, in the mid and long term. Uh, so in working with these partners to ensure that those supports um, continue to exist. With our out school time providers, they have been amazing in um, helping children as they adapt to the disruption in their education, providing virtual supports. Uh, but these organizations are struggling with the same uncertainty of their budgets and trying to figure out what does programming look like now and how will their programming continue into the summer. And lastly, we talked to our arts and culture organizations and organizations serving underrepresented populations. And with the arts and culture group related to the priority of the Emergency Action Fund, a lot of the organizations are dealing with canceled events, exhibitions, presentations, which they rely on for a significant part of their budget. Um, so how are, are they meeting that gap? Uh, and what does the future of arts and culture programming look like? Uh, for our underrepresented populations, we had wonderful conversations these organizations um, and just to share that uh, support and relief services rarely include undocumented residents. So they're working very hard to ensure that um, these resources are accessible, whether that's translating information and in documents or just making sure that people can get to the necessary resources. Um, so that is sort of a quick overview of what we heard uh, from the nonprofits that 
uh, we interviewed and conducted outreach with. And I'm going to pass it back to uh, Michelle, uh, who is going to talk about the recommendations that came from this work and some of the next steps. Michelle. Thank you, Chris. Um, so I know that that was a really quick overview of what Chris provided. I would love to also direct you to our website. So there's a report on our, the Emergency Action Fund page. Um, there's a tab called Conversations with Nonprofits. Um, and you can find a more detailed um, uh, and in-depth uh, understanding of what we've heard um, from our website. So um, that information, there's lots of it. Uh, and if you're interested, you can find more there. In terms of uh, what we did with what we heard, um, or what they told us we should do with what we heard, um, there are five recommendations uh, that, that we feel really resonated throughout the interviews, regardless of what sector we were talking to. Um, one of those, and probably not very surprising to you, is just provide unrestricted funding to nonprofits. As you know, foundations often have these different categories of support. Capacity building um, might be one. Uh, operating support is another. Programming support is one, where it's just for a defined purpose. But given all that's happening and how quickly things are changing on the ground, they really feel like to respond to the needs of the people that they serve, they need the flexibility. The other is to advocate for systems change. Um, as we said, one of the areas that we didn't fund in was in advocacy and public policy, but we do know that many of the things that are impacting nonprofits can be addressed through government action. And so um, they want us uh, to be one of the, the groups at the table um, helping to think about how do we advocate for um, systems change. Be a trusted partner. That's really just about, you know, particularly in the early days, there was just so much information, difficult to sift through, especially when you're providing services to people who are in urgent need of support or help. So they were looking to the foundation, to um, other philanthropies, um, to really be a trusted conveyor of information for them, to distill what is out there, what is it available to them in terms of grants or loans or government funding. Um, or additional supports for their staff, and how do we get that information to them in a way that is digestible and relevant to their work. The other last two recommendations, um, uh, one is about learning and responding. Um, we only talked to 50 or so organizations, uh, 100, uh, over 100 if you include our arts organizations, um, and there's this idea that as things are changing, we have to learn and respond to those needs, particularly those who experience the greatest barriers. And what they mean by greatest barriers are um, immigrants and refugees, as uh, Chris talked about on this, during his time, um, individuals and children impacted by intimate partner violence. Um, there's been an increase, as you've seen in the news, an increase in, um, uh, in cases of domestic violence, but also more challenges for uh, victims and survivors to get access to the supports they need because of stay-at-home orders. Uh, people of color who are disproportionately impacted by the virus, and I'm sure you've seen um, in the news about that. And then seniors and people with disabilities as well, who may have a more difficult time accessing what they need um, and getting and maybe more isolated during this time. And then the last is just to be proactive, that um, there are so many things that we don't know yet, um, but as well as addressing immediate needs that we can proactively seek out, what is the next thing that we really need to be helping and supporting with? Um, our response to that um, really is captured in, in five areas that I think are, are really specific. Um, connecting organizations to other resources at the foundation and other community resources. So also on that emergency action fund page, there um, are these tabs around how do you get help and also how do you give help. Um, and there are resources there for nonprofits as well as through their conversations with our staff as we can, directing them to resources. There's also a regular community call with nonprofits that we do. So um, our Small and Mighty grantees have a specific community call we do with them about every three or four weeks, um, as well as with the nonprofits that we interviewed. So that wasn't just a one-off so we could get information. That was really about an ongoing relationship that we want to have with our grantees so that we are always understanding what's changing on the ground, how are they being impacted, and how can we support. We've also converted many of our grants to operating support for organizations that had a project-related grant. They were going to, you know, do something really specific in an out-of-school time program um, or maybe a performance that they can no longer do because of what's happening. Um, those grants have been converted to operating support so that they have the flexibility to continue to, to respond to what's needed as well as to sustain their operations. 
Um, we're prioritizing under-resourced groups, uh, particularly those who are outside of the city. There are lots of resources in the, inside of the city um, limits. The further you go out to those first and second ring suburbs, there are fewer nonprofit organizations, particularly social service organizations. So even in the Emergency Action Fund, we really look at who's working in the Mon Valley, who's working in Still Rock, who's working in Atrona Heights, places where we know that there's um, immense needs, but there may be fewer social services to support people, and we'll continue to do that. Um, and the other is responding to policy opportunities. Yesterday, we posted a policy alert. We had about 100 nonprofit partners. Uh, we brought uh, elected officials and nonprofits together to talk about a supplemental nutrition assistance program. Um, some people may know it as food stamps or SNAP. Um, it's a program uh, that is funded by the government that allows us to, allows individuals who um, need help securing food to have those resources. Um, and except we know that folks have barriers, particularly in a time where um, you're not supposed to go to the grocery store, uh, delivery uh, fees, pickup fees, um, and the ability to just purchase online. Um, you can't do that if you have uh, SNAP. And so um, looking at what is currently happening um, across the country um, to make that accessible to individuals who rely on SNAP to feed their families. So we, these are some of the things that we're doing uh, beyond the Emergency Action Fund I mean, within an emergency action fund to be responsive to needs on the ground. And um, now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague in our donor services department, Christy Suber, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about how you can continue to help. Thank you, Michelle. So before um, I move on to how you can help, I do want to remind you if you have any questions about anything you've heard so far, please go to the question box in your control panel and type in your questions. We'll have time at the end to um, get more information from the panelists. But you probably are wondering, how can I help? We got a lot of really good information, so now what? And we have four areas that we think you could be really useful in and that might be useful to you. And the first would be to give to the Emergency Action Fund. As was mentioned, the need is greater than what we've raised so far. We're anticipating being short about $250,000 to be able to fund the organizations in the last two rounds that we want to support. So if you're interested in providing support to the Emergency Action Fund, talk to your donor services officer. Consider attending the webinar on May 28th at 9 a.m. about good grant making. This will be particularly useful during this time, how you think about using your financial resources strategically and in a way that has meaning for you. We mentioned having a lot of declined nonprofits. If you're interested in learning more about those, you can talk to your donor services officer about those unfunded applications to see which may align with your areas of interest. And then finally, continue to support the nonprofits you care about. You all are doing this already. Our total donor advised fund grant making is up 60% over last year during this time. This does include the grants that were made from the Emergency Action Fund, which was contributed to by many of you. So we're very busy making grants to the community and getting money out, and we're very appreciative of what you've done. We ask you to continue to do that. And then take into consideration what Michelle heard from the nonprofit. When possible, consider giving unrestricted support. Um, continue to be trusted partners. You're a trusted partner for us as a nonprofit community, and we hope that you're gonna share what you learned today with other people in your network so you can help the um, good informed philanthropists in our community. And system change is a big issue. Um, you can address that in lots of ways, voting, writing to your legislators, and we would hope that you would use your voice as well as your financial resources to do so. Um, before we move to questions and answers, I wanna also thank you. It's been inspiring to be with all of you during this time. I miss your faces so much, but I'm happy to see your names on my screen right now and have had calls and emails from you asking how you can help. It really, uh, helped me during this really um, uncertain time. So uh, we can move to questions and answers. If you have anything that's coming up for you, please go ahead and put it in the question box. We do have one question that's come in about how people can see or find the list of funded grants that we've made so far. I can take this one on if that's okay with the panelists. Um, if you go to our homepage, you'll see our big banner that has that spread hope image that Lindsay pointed out earlier. Below that, um, 
there's three areas that you can focus on. One is how to apply, how to support, and then the third button has the list of awarded grants. Some people have asked me if they can see that list because they may want to consider supporting those organizations in more depth as well. Another question that um, I have for the panelists is, what has been your biggest takeaway during this time? What have you seen and heard in the community that you're going to remember? I'd love to hear from each of you. I guess I'll answer first. Um, okay. Um, so the thing that I think I take away from this time is how incredibly resilient our communities are. Um, and particularly, and in addition to that, the nonprofits that serve them. Um, with, you know, the announcement of a closure of a facility of schools within hours, um, organizations, community members, residents, um, really galvanized themselves, um, thought about what it, what it was that they could do to respond, and then did. Um, and some with very little resources um, at their disposal. Um, we've also seen mutual aid networks um, pop up throughout communities, and uh, a mutual aid network is one that is um, either where resources or supports are offered um, by the individual residents um, or neighbors within a community. So they're not funded by government, they're not funded by philanthropy, they are solely dependent upon the resources within a community, and these networks have become strong, um, uh, reliable resources for folks who otherwise may not have access to what they need. Um, and those are things like getting to the grocery store, transportation, when folks can't take the bus anymore because they don't feel safe doing so, um, and or using uh, um, share ride, ride sharing services. Um, and so for those individuals, um, having somebody that they know, that they trust, who's a neighbor that they can rely on, a phone number they can call to get that support. Um, so I'm just in awe um, and very grateful to be part of a community that responds um, really rapidly, uh, and not because they're being asked to, but because they feel like it is their responsibility. Thank you, Michelle. Chris and Lindsay, would you like to add anything? Um, I think from you know my perspective in the donor services department, um, it's been amazing to me to watch the response from our donors in this crisis, um, from you know all of the kind of things that we've had to do so quickly to accommodate our donors and the daily operations of the Pittsburgh Foundation were done almost immediately to try to get us you know working remotely and just the um, understanding, compassion, um, you know, all the challenges that may have been there prior to this pandemic, just, it just has become more a, I understand where you're coming from, you know, thank you so much for what you're doing in this community. So it's been, um, despite these uncertain times, um, you know, being an speaking from the staff of the Pittsburgh Foundation, it's been a real pleasure to, um, be able to address the need and to 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 go to bed each night thinking, wow, you know, we've all come together to do something to help in these times. Thanks, Lindsay. Chris, would you like to add anything from your perspective? So just that I should have gone first because Michelle uh, shared my, my thoughts um, so well. Uh, the level of need out there is is, is so large and, and great. And when we talk to our partners who are doing everything they can to meet the needs of individuals in our communities. I'm just um, in, impressed and, and so grateful and appreciative of their continued commitment. Um, sometimes the situation is changing hourly, um, but they've always just continued to ensure that they are thinking about how to get resources and support uh, to individuals in our community. Um, They've been tough conversations, reading some of the, the grant applications that have come in have been, you know, tough and challenging, but uh, throughout it all, it's just been this resilience um, and the strength within uh, the nonprofits uh, that we have the great fortune to, to work with, um, to ensuring that the individual needs um, in our community are being met. 
So I just want to echo Michelle's um, things and appreciation for those on the ground. Great, thank you. And Michelle and Chris, you both mentioned the great need. So what's next? What will be the next thing that we focus on as a foundation and that our funders should, our donors should consider funding? So that's, that's a challenging question. I think that um, there is certainly a pivot um, that will happen away from kind of this crisis response um, in terms of like what is needed at this very, very moment um, uh, as we've seen with the kinds of applications that have come in um, to thinking about what do we need to do in order to ensure that critical organizations are stable um, and are strong uh, to continue to deliver the supports and services that um, communities rely on, um, as well as beginning to understand what does economic recovery look like and what is the role that the community foundation should play in that. Um, and so uh, I think in terms of what's next, uh, we'll continue to uh, probably double down on our 75-year history of meeting basic needs. That is what we do. We do well. Um, and and we'll want to make sure that organizations that have come alongside us in that mission are continue to be strong, um, as well as looking at, again, what is needed for economic recovery and, and what are some gaps. Um, we'll certainly be looking at policy um, and policy change and where are there are opportunities for us to use our voice um, in that space um, to make sure that people have what they need to thrive. Um, so those are just some things, I think, in a general sense that are, are coming, but um, as part of our donor family, we should definitely expect to hear more specifics as they as they emerge. Thanks, Michelle. And the last question before we turn it back to Lisa Schroeder is, um, what is a better strategy to contribute to an unrestricted to contribute unrestricted dollars to a nonprofit or to write a check for the emergency action fund. I'm not sure who wants to take that one on. Lindsay, maybe. I mean, I would say that that at this stage, both are um, are of utmost need. Nonprofits are looking for unrestricted support, so certainly. That's welcome. We're also doing similar funding through the Emergency Action Fund. So um, I would highly recommend both. I would just add to that, if there's an organization that you're very um, connected to, that you feel very strongly about, they need your support right now. And if um, there's not one that you're really connected to, you've already supported them, as Lindsay said, in other ways, then you may want to consider the Emergency Action Fund. Um, Lisa Schroeder, we're going to turn it back to you to close us out. I want to thank you all again for joining us today and engaging with us. I hope you feel connected now to all that your generous assistance has made possible. And we will count on you to join us, communicate with us, and work with us as we move forward to make the most of philanthrop philanthropic assistance in the months and indeed in the years ahead. Uh, the challenges that we have before us will provide an opportunity to take the lessons of our experience and our history of reaching out, the talent of our staff and our relationships and collaborations with grantees, constituents and partners to meet the needs and challenges that the Pittsburgh Foundation has always been dedicated to solve, but which are more now more urgent than ever. Whether your passion is education or healthcare, technology or the arts, research or social justice, fighting climate change or food distribution, this is our time to make a difference, to make our region once again a model of resiliency by fighting hard to build a healthier and yes, happier, more equitable, just society. Let's keep pushing ahead together. Until next time, know that your generosity inspires us and sets an example. And please stay safe. Thank you.
Okay, thank you all. <clears throat> this is Edward again. Thank you all very much for uh, your time and uh, go ahead and close out this webinar. And uh, thank you to all the attendees for joining us.